Hey everybody, welcome back to Your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. We're so glad you decided to join us. We're actually in the middle of a three-part series talking about the Enneagram, our new proprietary uh, approach to the Enneagram, EIP or Enneagram Internal Profile, and what it means to live out our sense of calling. So we hope this is going to be helpful for you because it's been profoundly helpful for us in understanding the various seasons as we've tried to live out our giftedness uh, for God's glory and our joy. Now, there's a story I told in the previous episode about my experience and training under Dr. Dan Allender with um, the Allender School. And the basic premise is this, is that the gifts that we've been given by God, that he has given us by, in, I mean, he's prepared good works mm-hmm. for us to do. Yep. He's chosen the seasons in which we've lived. Yep. He's knit us together in a mother's womb. He's bestowed gifts to us by his spirit for the purposes of being instruments of his grace in the world. And so this idea that I we've had these gifts, and but in light of the tragedy, the trauma, just the fallenness of our world and sinfulness of our world, we have used these gifts in ways that are not honoring to God, but more self-protective ways in order to protect ourselves from pain. Right. Now, but why, because of the truth of the gospel, because of what Jesus has done in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, uh, these parts of us now compelled by love and by God's spirit actually become gifts that we use in our sense of calling. Now, if you're not familiar with EIP, we just released a book on September 20th talking about the Enneagram internal profile. It's in our book, More Than Your Number. You can buy it wherever books are sold. And this is just an application of the fundamentals of EIP. So we today we have Adam Breckenridge, our Director of Coaching, uh, joining us today. Adam, welcome. Glad you're here again. Hey, Adam. Hey, so glad to be here. And Adam, why don't you start us off by explaining to everyone, uh, what is the Enneagram internal profile? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, well, it's, it's like you said, Jeff, Enneagram internal profile is based on this idea that we are more than our number, mm-hmm. which is the subject of your new book, mm-hmm. which launched September 20th. And so uh, the basic idea is um, we exist in parts. We have parts. And the Enneagram internal profile um, is, says that each main type is made up of six parts. Your main type uh, kind of constitutes two of those parts. You have a beloved child and a wounded child, which you can operate in any given moment out of either one of those uh, parts. Um, and then your two Enneagram wings and your Enneagram paths make up the other parts of you. And so it's this idea that these, these are, this almost functions like an internal family of parts. And, uh, and so it's kind of parts work, if you're familiar with internal family systems, plus the Enneagram to create a new system, uh, revolutionary system in, in the Enneagram space. And uh, what I love about it is because it's, for me personally, is it's helped me not just understand and have self-awareness about myself, which is huge and very important, uh, but it's helped me actually connect relationally with these parts of myself. And what I've learned through EIP is that my parts, you know, these parts of me, these parts of Adam um, can either show up in service of the wounded child or in service of the beloved child. And if they're showing up in service of the wounded child, they will, as Allender said, Jeff, as you reminded us, they will over rely on their strengths and gifts and they will show up in hyper protective, anxious ways. Um, or if they're showing up in service of, of the beloved child who I really am in Christ, they use their gifts to make healthy connections, set healthy boundaries, bless the world, do good for humanity, and they show up in these life-giving ways. And so mm-hmm. in a nutshell, that's, that's Enneagram internal profile. Yep. Well, what I love about um, applying the lens of EIP to understanding our sense of calling is that we carry within us stories of both our God-given glory being gifted by His Spirit for, the, for His kingdom purposes, and it also helps us to understand why we carry shame when it comes to 
uh, living out our sense of calling. Now, today we're going to talk about imposter syndrome, which is a huge part. As we've mentioned, we're going to be opening our Becoming an Enneagram Coach course uh, here in the coming weeks. And so uh, we've had talked with thousands of people about why they want to and what's keeping them from actually living out a dream of using the Enneagram as a tool and working with others because they've experienced such personal benefit. They long to be an instrument uh, of joy and peace and assurance to others by becoming an Enneagram coach. But there are a lot of reasons that hold them back. And the number one of number one of those yep. is the imposter syndrome. Well, EIP helps us to understand which parts of us actually carry the messages that make up how we experience imposter syndrome. Or I would say how each part That's right. holds. Now, the key to all of this is our understanding of the gospel. It's in moving uh, these various parts of us, leading them, shepherding them, pastoring them, caring for them, so that they can understand the truth of the gospel so that we can then move forward in life by faith. Mm-hmm. There's a passage that uh, I w- that came to mind just a few minutes ago as Adam was talking, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 50. Now, there's a book called The Silence of Adam by Larry Crabb, who he's the first one that it kind of explained this dynamic as it related to calling. And this is what Isaiah said. This is Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? And that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> so God knows exa- exactly what's going on in the hearts right. of his people. Right. Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, which is something we all experience. We talked a little bit about understanding our past, understanding our future as it relates to calling and how much providence has been put in our life. But God doesn't tell us what the future is going to hold. Uh, We have to walk into the future by faith and that his word and his spirit are going to enlighten our path. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says this, let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. But now all of you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, mean you've taken matters into your own hand to bring a light to your path mm. that's not the God-given light of his word or spirit. Go walk in the light of your fires and of the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you will receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Mm. Now, there's a couple of different ways about that huge warning that comes at the end of the passage about lying down in torment. There's something about the present reality of just living in anxiety, particularly for Israel to be uh, uh, conquered by all these other nations. And then there's the, we'll use, I'll use a big term, the eschatological of like our future of whether or not we live by faith in Christ or not. But for us, the way that we're discussing this is in our present reality of when we don't know what to do and we take matters into our own hand, we choose ways that actually bring about our own discomfort and angst in life. Another way you could say it is self-sabotage. Self-sabotage, that's right. But the other way is that when we trust in God by embracing what we don't know and what we know he's not going to give us, actually we hold on by faith that he will be a light unto our path, that the Spirit will remind us of all the things that Christ has taught us. And matter of fact, uh, even Paul prays in Ephesians 2 that our hearts would be illuminated to all of the glorious riches that we have in Christ. But see, that wounded part of our heart doesn't show up that way. Mm. It's going to take matters into uh, its own hands, and all of the other parts are going to follow accordingly. On the flip side of that, all of that is especially true for our beloved self. Mm -hmm. When, by faith, I use my gifts, and they actually become an instrument in our Redeemer's hands. So remembering the gospel is going to be vital, crucial to all of this. Well, we're going to talk through this uh, for each of us. Uh, Beth's going to go first and talk about a recent story she had. Um, That's right, within the past few weeks, a story (laughs) about imposter syndrome and how it showed up for her. Then we'll also talk with Adam. And if we have enough time, I might jump in with a story as well. But if you could, as you're listening or as you're watching, 
be sure to write down these questions that we'll be asking one another as examples of the questions you can be asking yourself about how your parts are playing a role in imposter syndrome and actually keeping you back Mm -hmm. from living by faith and trusting that God has your back and that you can, with childlike faith, take risk. You can, with childlike faith, have assurance that even through difficult seasons that the Lord's going to be with you. And it's going to feel really, really hard and very challenging to go in that path, but that actually lets you know you're headed in a good direction. You know, it's really interesting you say that because in the recovery world, um, we have a phrase that if you're not doing it scared, if you're not doing it, if it's not messy, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Because it's not linear and we, we want it to be. We create discipleship material that's linear. Well, and also I think in America, and maybe just the world, but we live here, that's what everything is designed to be. Easier, you know, bigger, better, you know, user-friendly, you know. So if if it seems hard or challenging or difficult or you have to persevere, it feels like something's got to be wrong. Yeah, that's right. When, in fact, it could be the very gift and... Um, assurance that we're on the right track. That's right. So Beth, let's talk about your recent experience with imposter syndrome. Now, this is a very vulnerable story. I'm, I'm happy that uh, that you are willing to share it because it was very meaningful. And even up until our arrival in Dallas for the this recent AACC event, um, it was tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, we picked up Adam and Little Rock on our way, and then we even got into a conversation about it again with Adam in the car. Yeah. So why don't you share about what was going on leading up? I mean, because it was a month, two months you were experiencing yeah. this because it was such a big deal. So tell us about what the opportunity was first. Yeah. So we've had this desire for years now to get CEUs, so continuing education units or credits for our mental health practitioners for our big course, Become an Enneagram Coach. And we've run into like every brick wall possible until the AACC group, which is, again, American Association of Christian Counselors, uh, wanted to team up with us. And we were like, that's amazing. So we just finished creating the Become an Enneagram Informed Mental Health uh, Professional course. Um, and we were going to launch it at their conference, which was really exciting. We I um, co-created and taught with Dr. Mercy Connors. And we were just ecstatic at the opportunity with such great people um, that will really bless that community. So we were going, you know, out there to set up our own booth and let people know about it and all that stuff. Well, then we got... (laughs) Well, they gave us what we wanted. (laughs) (laughs) Then we got the email saying, Beth's going to be on stage at night, like when most of the... The first night. The first night when most of the people are there. Uh, speaking between Dr. Townsend and uh, Dr. Dr. Tony, Tony Evans. Evans. Uh, and... did, did you just hear that? So <laughs> Beth, the Enneagram coach, is going to be speaking after Dr. Townsend, Mr. Wrote M- Mr. Co-Boundary, yep. um, and Dr. Tony Evans, He's just an a, amazing pastor. Huge, a, a significant pastor within the evangelical church and its impact upon the United States and around the world. And that part was a huge honor. And? But <laughs> I instantly had this gut feeling of being scared and small, but not because of Townsend and Evans. It was more the fact that the people that come to these events and especially those that are presenting or bringing their books and materials, you know, these are just really big thought leaders in our community and they have different, all kinds of letters behind their names, different letters behind their name. Um, And so how that landed on me and for my story with EIP is that my wounded child, who I call her little Bethy, you know, she's the younger part of myself who's scared and hurt um, by all the different things she experienced as a child. How old, um, when you think about that, how old? I would she say was? eight-ish is mm-hmm. probably eight or nine. So is, first grade maybe, yeah. second grade? Yeah, pro- probably in the, in the realm of six to eight years old is, yeah. is when I see her. 
And so she's going, what just happened? Wait, like, we cannot do this. Like, we don't have the same letters behind our name. We don't have the same, you know, expertise or clout in the counseling world, which is true. That That is true. I am not a counselor. I did not get my master's or PhD or anything like that. And not only that, but little Bethy's like, hey, everyone, I grew up with a reading disability. Do you not know this? Which is funny because I've now written 11 books, co-authored two of them with you. <laughs> but she's just like, I don't belong on this stage. They're going to figure it out. They're going to find out that it's me, little Bethy, on the stage. And everyone's going to see me and wonder, why is she there? And then I feared they're going to ask me all of these counseling questions that I'm not going to have answers to. Now, AACC knew that. That's why we partnered with them. That's why Dr. Mercy Connors is there to, to take the helm of all of the mental health practitioner um, teaching components. And I'm just teaching on the Enneagram. But little Bethy wanted nothing to know about this. She was convinced, no, you don't understand. You're, I'm going to be found out that this is all like not okay. And I just shouldn't show up. And so I wrestled with this for a very long time. So you were uh, you're in a coaching relationship with Dr. Allison Cook. Yep. You and her were preparing for what is this going to look like? How can yep. we coach and be present with one another? Up yeah, to the I event? reached out to um, Dr. Allison Cook, who wrote uh, co-wrote Boundaries uh, for Your Soul with uh, Kimberly Miller. Um, because one, I just, that book was awesome. And then I reached out because her new book that just released, The Best of You, as I was reading, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's literally speaking to me. And so I reached out and I said, hey, do you have any spaces for, because we're cross um, state uh, lines. Yes. So she is my coach, not my therapist. Anyway, um, I was like, I would love to just go in a new directions with you because I feel like your book really um, hit a great place in my heart. And so we have, and I, on my, one of my sessions, I'm like, I'm freaking out inside. And I, and I said, she says, is it the speaking? I'm like, no, I actually love getting on stage. I don't get nervous or scared. It's actually where I would say the beloved part of my heart shines. Like I love it. Um, and I said, that's why this is taking me aback because little Bethy is screaming inside and trying everything to like convince myself and the team that this shouldn't happen. And so I knew logically that everything was okay. I knew logically that it was going to be okay, but I needed to tend to this part of my heart that had some, for her, some real concerns and grievances that I needed to address. So let's just walk through EIP and the messages that each of the parts contributed yeah. to this. So let's talk about the type three part. Uh, you call her Natalie. Um, what were the messages? Because she's act she's activated, but she's working on behalf of Bethy. Little Bethy, yeah. Mm -hmm. What were her messages? So obviously, when when all of when little Bethy is in the lead, so we we call it as in. Uh, Driving the bus. Right, driving the bus so that we got that analogy from um, Boundaries for Your Soul. And so when little Bethy's driving the bus, you don't want a six to eight-year-old driving the bus. You can imagine that literally self-sabotage, right? So when she's driving the bus, everyone else is freaking out as well, right? So my type three part, I call her when she's in this misaligned place, not good enough Natalie, because she's usually giving me that message, you're not good enough you're not going to be able to pull this off. You know, you're what are fraud. people going to think? You know, they're going to like yeah. find you out. You know, we have to like do all this stuff to get over all these hurdles. Um, and so she's really trying to um, escalate the fear so that we don't show up and get either exposed or seen as a failure or worthless. And then um, tell me about your... Um... Type one, uh, which is one of your wings. That's Victoria. Well, I'll probably go, let's go with my type six part first. Okay, great. Because Wendy shows up usually before my type one part. Oh, I see, good. So Wendy is worrying Wendy when she's misaligned. <laughs> and she's worrying way too much. She is thinking of all the worst case scenarios, which then only adds to Natalie's list of why this isn't going to work. So Wendy's thinking, 
okay, people are going to come up and ask me questions that I can't answer because I'm, I'm not, you know, a PhD. I'm not a counselor or therapist. How are you going to answer these questions? And she's convinced I have to be the one. I have to have all the expertise. So she has all of this self-doubt, this worry. Um, well, and, that, and that's a good point because you've brought this up a few times about I. And there is a way in which imposter syndrome yep. isolates us. Yeah, and you, it, you it's correct shame. when we would talk about this on the way down, you're like, you know, I, and you said every time you're like, I want to keep encouraging you <laughs> and to not say I, but to say a part of me. Um, but, and I think that's such a good point because in our mind and in our world, all of these parts we think culminate into the I, like this is me, this is what's true. And they're trying to convince us that it's true. So when you were both and you were all of the right. above, you were excited, thrilled, yeah. honored, yeah. I'm like, scared, I, I can't ashamed, wait <laughs> to, you know, to present this to everyone. I can't wait to release this course. Um, and super scared. So I agree. So part of me, so Wendy is freaking out and all worried and she's just throwing up so many red flags and possible worst case scenarios. And then Natalie grabs those and is like, oh my gosh, we're going to be exposed. We're going to be found out that we don't have the worth and the value. And then Victoria, my type one comes in and when she's in a misaligned way, she's more vicious. So she's very critical, judgmental, um, and really wants to expose the right and the wrong. This is wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. Who allowed this to happen? You know? And so she comes in with much more of a, like a sledgehammer, you know, approach to uh, what Natalie is doing. And that's when I really want to shut down. So little Bethy at that point, the type nine of my heart, as a type nine, we want to shut down, numb out, run away, quit, you name it, I'm out of here. Um, and that's what she's feeling. But she also, or they all know I can't. Like, this is going to happen. We, <laughs> we, are, we are going to Dallas. I'm going to be on the stage. And so, which is a godsend in, in, in a sense that little Bethy can't run away. Little Bethy can't numb out and check out. And so it really um, put me in a position that I had, well, I didn't have to work on it, but I saw that this was a great opportunity to work on what was going on because this kind of thing is going to pop up from time to time in my life for different things that are happening. Um, and how can I navigate this in a healthier way? How can I help little Bethy understand that I hear her, that I understand her concerns, I understand her fears. Same with, you know, my type six part, my three part, my one part, how can I assist them? Well, I wanna ask Adam a question. Adam, you've done a lot of work around uh, shame. And whenever you hear uh, Beth's story and this whole path that she was walking down led by her wounded part, Bethy, uh, what, how do you see shame playing itself out in the story that Beth's uh, sharing? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think shame is fundamentally a sense of, um, I mean, if you were going to, if you were going to attach a single emotion to imposter syndrome, a lot of people would say imposter syndrome is about fear. It's a fear of being exposed. It's a fear of being seen as a fraud. But I recently actually heard Dan Allender say, our greatest fear is not death. Our greatest fear is actually the fear of shame because shame is being uh, abandoned, not wanted, um, uh, worthless, unlovable, unloved and unlovable. And so shame always has to do with how I see me and how I see others seeing me. And if I see myself as not good enough, uh, I don't have what it takes. I'm a fraud. I'm going to be found out. Really, if you want to peel back the layer under the hood of consciousness, what's on the mm -hmm. other side of that is, and they're going to leave me. Right. Uh, or I won't have a, and, and, and that's the way a six might say it. A six might say it that way, but you can say it, put it in your own words. Yeah. Like for I, me I'm as a nine, have, 
it, it's more. Yeah, how, how would you say it? Yeah. So for me, it, in some ways it's that because we're high, we want connection as well, but it's more of, I want peaceful connection and peaceful relationships. I want, I want people to walk away feeling that we've given them this incredible course to help them right where they are in their mental health practice. And I want, I want everyone to be happy and good and excited, you know? And so if there's any pushback or tension for me as a nine, I'm like, oh no, you know? So yeah, it's, it's similar is in connection. It just looks a tiny bit different. That's right. That's right. And you may say it different ways. I'm not going to have my place anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to belong or matter anymore. Um, But I, you know, I, that's, that's kind of how I hear shame, you know, playing itself out. And Beth, we had a moment in the car on the way down to AACC and you don't have to go there if you don't want to. Uh, But we were talking about connecting with this part of yourself that carries this burden of shame. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier, like I've got to tend to little Bethy, I've got to care for her. So, um, you know, what, what was that process like of caring for her? Because clearly you did do some care for, you cared for her enough that you, and you got up on the stage, you presented, which by the way, was in both of you were, you killed it. It was amazing. And you <laughs> totally belong on that stage and prove that you did. But um, bring us into how, how you cared for her and the shame that she was feeling. Yeah. So, you know, I would say the one part of my heart can really um, unravel me very quickly into a spiral of shame. And mm-hmm. now they all play a part, like you guys have just heard. So they all play a part and it kind of builds and builds and builds. And then my one part um, just is, sees all the evidence uh, that they're presenting and just really brings like, I, like I said, a slam, sledgehammer. Like a or strong inner critic. Like strong mm-hmm. inner critic. And mm-hmm. I think you asked a really good question because, um, you know, we talk often about in our AWARE acronym, AWAKE, so it's A, AWAKEN, WELCOME, ASK, RECEIVE, AND en- ENGAGE. And that's in our, our book. But when you get to, so we want to awaken to what's going on. So I was very much awakened to all the things <laughs> <laughs> that was happening. I mean, it is amazing how when opportunity presents itself and it's a particular ambition, desire, longing that we have to participate in it, it wakes mm-hmm. our all of our team up. Yep. They were all <laughs> on high alert. Yeah. But then the next one is welcome. And we want to welcome what we're observing without shame and judgment, condemnation. It's literally to receive what we're seeing as it is. And that's where you kind of chimed in. You said, hey, Beth, you know, this part of you that really brings in all of this shame and condemnation, have you been able to, I'm paraphrasing because you said it way better, but how how have you taken the time to bless this part? And I was thinking, what are you talking about? I want nothing to do with blessing this part. We're talking about blessing an an inner critic. Right. Like this part devastates me. This part is so hurtful and painful in my life. A long story of harm. Yeah. It goes back, you know, yeah. And, And I was one, there was a part of me that, wanted to punch you in the face. That was probably my eight part. <laughs> yeah, you're not being a good friend unless you want to punch them in the face because they've asked a redemptive question. <laughs> now, so I call her Regina and she's wanting to protect me, you know, and be like, what? Sure. You know, like that of part course. over there is so mean to her. You know, she brings of up course. all this shame and all the things that she's thought or heard from years past, et cetera. Um, but the grace of God allowed me to hear it in just such a clearer way that you're right. This type one part of my heart, this inner critic, is doing the best it can, just like all the other parts in their wounded state. It's trying its best to help me to get through the world, to get through this challenge. The way it's going about it is super painful. And I thought, huh, I don't think I've really taken the time to understand how it's going about that, how it yeah. thinks this is helpful <laughs> because everyone else is like, this is not helpful. Um, but It I, is interesting because as you were experiencing the negative parts of this one part, type one part in your life, it was also a gift to you because we were so well scripted. Our slides 
were to the point, our right. presentation was to the point, right. what is the absolute clearest clearest message that we could give in this 20-minute segment for this evening. And so this part of her that was showing up in two radically different ways, right. but trying to navigate it all is what a nine doesn't want to do. Like yeah. you don't want all of this disruptiveness. No, absolutely not. I just want peace and harmony internally and externally. And, and so, But it was your beloved child that led you through yeah. the process. Yeah, so when you said yeah. that, I, I realized that was the missing piece because my type 8 part, she's always got my back. She is the one protecting oh, yeah. me now, or at least that's what it feels like. She's protecting me from all the in, other inner parts that have, are, you know, demolishing me and the, out, the outside world. But what I was thinking was that this one part of my heart was actually against me, and so I treated it such Whereas when you ask that question, I realize, wait, it's actually trying to help me. It just lands on me in a way that's really hurtful and painful. And so how can I thank it, you know, and be grateful to its attempts to help me, but also how can Coach Beth, my beloved child part, help lead, guide, pastor, shepherd, whatever you want to call the wording, how can I help it to come under the alignment of the gospel and trust that God has given me this opportunity that, no, I am not the expert in all things, and that's okay. That's why we have AACC partnering with us. That's why we have Dr. Connors. And I can simply hand over questions that aren't for me to answer. And, and I mean, what, what a fundamental truth of discerning the spirit versus an inner critic. Right. Creativity. Oh. Yeah. And number yeah. two... I'm not alone. I mean, all of a sudden, all of this fear, and you know, the Lord tells us that do not fear for I'm with you, reminds you like, oh, my Heavenly Father's with me because I've got Dr. Connors with me. I've got Jeff with me. I've got my, my team, team behind my back. I, That's right. There was fear and shame, isolate. Like yeah. you, you're alone yeah. in it. Like it doesn't lead you to community, right. and you stayed engaged with Dr. Cook. You stayed engaged with me. You stayed engaged with Adam. I would say that the probably the biggest turning point and why things got so much better by the time we got there is when I'm in that misaligned place, fearful place, you know, uh, triggered, activated state, whatever you all want to call it. It was, and it was more self focused. And I'm not saying that because I think a lot of Christians would paint that as, oh, you're being selfish, you know, or self-consumed, you know. And I think that's just a natural, you know, it, either it's flight, fight, freeze, or fawn. You know, this these were this was a defensive um, mechanism and instinct that was coming up that I needed to address. But where things shift is when we got to AACC and I then was able to see all of those other people that are there that I get to talk with, bless, encourage, um, give information to that they're looking for. It took me from seeing just the inside world, which again, we don't want to like shun that. We want to address it, but it helped me to see what God's purposes were right before me and the actual gifts and talents and abilities that I've been given in this moment to help certain people. And it's to interesting walk to bring by that faith up because Jesus oftentimes asks the disciples, do you see? Yeah. Do you uh -huh. see this person? Do you see this woman? Do you see the crowd that's like sheep without a shepherd? And even that is a sign of God's spirit at work out right. of, through the lens of your beloved self. Yeah, just to it, see it that people really did value It wasn't me are. just going, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that's Beth. Right. Let's go. Like that, that wasn't right. going to work. But it was God's grace in helping my eyes to see the people he was bringing right before me to bless in whatever way he deemed that I should. Well, I'd love to make I'd love to make a quick observation on this sure. because I, I, I hearing you talk and then actually being there live and watching this happen. Uh -huh. I saw your inner critic move from toxic shame to healthy shame. And if healthy mm -hmm. shame is a new category for people, then just you can replace that with humility. And this, mm -hmm. by the way, can be a telltale sign of, of whether or not your, your inner critic is in this one part of your heart um, or whatever, for other people listening, whatever part, you know, your inner mm -hmm. critic shows up as 
whether or not it shows up as aligned or misaligned. Yeah. Um, because healthy shame, Chip Dodd has this line where he talks about when we're living in healthy shame or when we're living in humility, we recognize four things. And you embodied these four things on stage that night. Number one, I need you and you need me. Hmm. So you walked up on stage understanding that people in the room needed you. They needed to hear what you have to say, but also you, you need them. Hmm. Number two, I'm not God and neither are you. <laughs> um, number three, I don't have all the answers, but I do have some. Hmm. And then number four, I make mistakes and so do you. Hmm. And I saw you walk up on the stage and, and just basically say like, you just embodied this humility, this, this honorable, powerful humility of, I don't have all the answers, but I do have some. In, in other words, I belong on this stage between Townsend uh, and, um, uh, Tony Evans. oh goodness, Tony Evans. I belong on this stage. Yeah. You know, this I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I have something to contribute. And, and I think I, we watched your inner critic, Mike, make the journey from mm. uh, misaligned to aligned and bring a healthy, empowering humility, yeah. uh, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think the big thing I want people to walk away just hearing this story is that we all have these experiences. And a lot of times they're a much smaller experience. You know, it could just be in your day to day life. You feel like the imposter syndrome, like maybe well, even I don't parenting. feel like a good, a good enough mom or oh, gosh, mom, I did wife. that all the time. Like, I'm not as good enough. You know, mom is so and so like they're so much better. I'm just this imposter or whatever, or wife or husband or best friend or person in the church, you know, or employee, employer, sure. um, we all have these and, and they pop up in, I would say more micro moments or little moments that we, we, they're like little bumps in the road that we just kind of step over. But over time, if we don't address them and see them, they become much bigger and all consuming. And that's where this event was. This, this event really was a very internally consuming moment but it also was the perfect opportunity to really see it and deal with it in the moment so that when these little moments pop up from time to time, I'll recognize it much sooner and also know, oh, those parts of my heart need tending to. These parts of my heart have their own story that Coach Beth needs to show up and give them, remind them of all the, the great blessings and insights and grace and that God has got me. Um, and so it's a, as much as it's not fun to go through these experiences, it's it's an honor and a privilege that God allows us to walk through them and to grow um, in such a way that the next time, hopefully we'll have a new perspective and a new trajectory to walk that path. Well, Adam, um, why don't you go next and just share whatever story about how you saw uh, EIP and your various parts uh, carrying the message of this being an imposter. Sure. I can share quickly. I, I want to point out what I agree with what you said, Beth, about most of the time the imposter shows up in like everyday ordinary stuff of life. And, and, and yeah, imposter syndrome, the imposter is an equal oppor opportunity offender or however you say that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's, there's no, there's no situation that he or she or this part of you might not show up. And and right. I, I feel like as a type six, I have several imposters. Um, and I, like, I remember as a pastor teaching every week, I would have serious doubts about whether or not I knew how to prep a sermon or, or, or mm. that I could stand up on stage and talk to someone. I, I, I would be convinced that even though I just did this last week and several weeks before and had been doing it for years, I right. was convinced that I was going to bomb and people were going to find out that I don't belong. Mm. And, um, a big, a big uh, life transition happened for me a couple of years ago. This was a, this is a bigger example. Um, I could give parenting anecdotes, or all, I could get all kinds of stuff. But uh, right. you know, roughly two years ago, I made a big life transition, left the church staff to join you guys, my friends, uh, with we your Enneagram tempters. coach. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we we were, lured you, you were in. <laughs> you wooed. You wooed. Yes. Um, <laughs> We've had, we had had a relationship. No, no, no woo. What's we don't that? have woo. We don't Sorry, have Adam. woo, but we somehow We don't have it. woo. 
<laughs> no, you guys are the woo. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 man. <laughs> Brownie points. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. It was, for me, it was uh, Give like. Give this guy a bonus. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what he's wanting. <laughs> You're the greatest leaders ever. <laughs> cha-ching, uh, yeah, cha-ching. Yeah. Ins- insert another uh, story from AACC where I got a bonus on the way up when Jeff oh, shared that was a little so bit funny. of his so, yeah, wait, wait, Dr. We got to sh- Zero with me. Yeah. So we so <laughs> Jeff goes inside and gets himself. A Dr. Pepper Zero, which is like Adam's favorite. Actually, no, it wasn't even. No, he pulled, got, you, he pulled yeah, a hot one. He pulled a hot one from. You it got was, ice. It was, he got ice. That's all he got was yeah. ice. So he poured his hot, <laughs> hot Dr. Pepper Zero, poured it in his cup, and there was just like a swig left. <laughs> and he put the lid on it. He's like, here, Adam, <laughs> you can have the rest. <laughs> and he was, was like very serious. And, and Adam was like, wow, this is great. I'm like, Adam, that's your bonus for the year right there. <laughs> So much no, fun. you guys are so so, so generous, and, and that, that's the only reason you can make those jokes is because of how generous you are. Um, but no, I, I mean, you remember when I the the I mean, I remember Susie said she wrote this down and like mm-hmm. has become part of her, you know, like something she's trying to build into to the culture of the staff. But I just and told Susie's her I was like, our I'll, chief operations right. officer for everybody who mm-hmm. uh, she's a type aide and mm-hmm. did some of the interviewing with uh, Adam. Uh huh. And she, and I just told her I was like, I want to work with safe people. Uh, not not like not perfect people, but people who are relationally safe. And that's that's you two. And that's that's why I joined the team. But I had to walk through so much of the imposter stuff, and still do. I'm still practicing my recovery with this part of myself. Uh, but I remember, you know, all I had known for nearly 20 years was pastoring vocationally in a local church. That's how I provided for my family. That's what I went to, I mean, you know, Bible college and seminary. And like, it was very scary for me to step out of my comfort zone and do anything different. And um, I, I knew there would be a huge learning curve, especially with the business side of things. You know, part of my role is to guide our coaches in creating and launching their their own coaching businesses. And mm-hmm. I'm I, I, the way I looked at myself was I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't have a marketing background. These are huge learning curves for me. And so I remember, and you guys will remember and this. It was. Oh, go ahead. Uh-huh. Well, I just want to I just want to affirm that you're right. It it is a huge learning curve going from because Jeff did the same thing. So he went from uh-huh. full time pastorate um, to our YEC entrepreneurial ministry. Um, so, and we affirmed that we said, yeah, you're right. You know, it, it is a big jump, well, but we also knew you and you and Jeff are so similar. I was like, dude, you've got this. We see your gifts. We see your talents. Yes. You have a, a lot to learn, but what we need at the end of the day is you and how God created you. Well, I mean, just think about it. So there you are pastoring and co-pastoring within a congregation of a few hundred people. And now you're moving in, you're being invited to a role of over 2,000 people who have made a big investment Mm -hmm. uh, for themselves, for their families. They're globally, they're not Mm -hmm. in person. And you have to find ways to communicate, shepherd, and help them to fulfill their sense of calling. I mean, it it was a huge leap. Huge, huge. Um, Even as you say that, you know, the, I can, I can feel the fear and, and, mm-hmm. and the, the imposter that wants to, I mean, all that part of me is always close. And I remember, I remember early on, uh, having this thought of part of me thought, what if we change the title of my role to shepherd of coaching instead of director of coaching? <laughs> and I think we did. I mean, we didn't change we, we it. We talked like, about it. No, but yeah, well, we didn't change it yeah. like for real, but I said, or one of us said, yeah, that is what you are. So if, if yes. that's what helps you get into this role yes. in a more um, assuring, safe way, then that's that's how you need to see it because you what, what are such a you, good shepherd. What part of you do you think carried that title that was fearful of director but was more comfortable with shepherd? Um, I, my three-part. Huh. Um, yep. I think my – well, honestly – each, each, I, I, I could walk through, I could yeah, walk through. Yeah, because I was, was going to even say five. Really. I could see the five saying, wait, we're yeah. not competent and capable enough. 
as I as I was saying that about three, that's the next place my my the five in me saying you don't know enough, you don't have the competency uh, to do this. The three is just simply saying you're not enough. You're going to fail. You're going to be exposed. We cannot let you. We cannot let the system. We've got to keep the system afloat. We can't. We can't let you be exposed. Uh, my type nine is saying, in a sense, my presence doesn't matter. And the way I would interpret, the way I would rephrase that is, you just, you don't belong. Your presence is not. You're not in the right spot. Like you don't belong here in this place. Um, and I think my type seven was just afraid of the pain that could like. There's so much on the line for me with my whole family and making this move of like taking care of my family, providing for my family. And, you know, my wife provides for the family as well, but, but obviously like I need a job. And, and it was this, the, I think the seven of me was like, um, run, like yeah. this is, this is too painful to survive. You won't survive. Well, and also, this. and that's, what's so great about EIP is that all of these parts are, are acting on behalf of your main type, the six. So the seven is yeah. feeling the fear of the six and yes. also kind of, I'm sure, so correct me if I'm wrong, also thinking, I don't want to be trapped in this fear. I don't want to be trapped in this self-doubt. I don't want to be yes. trapped. Get in, me out of here. Yeah. Like, I, I don't I don't know if this is going to be the right place to feel for it, the fun, the joy of life, because there's so much fear happening right now. And is yeah. that going to perpetuate forever. Yeah. And they were all f operating out of my wounded child. They were all serving right. the, the wounded child who, who was feeling deeply anxious and unsettled and afraid. Yeah. Um, and so where did not where and yeah. when did the beloved child part of your heart come on and, and change things? And and then also what's been the process being with us for basically a year and a half, a little bit more? <laughs> Because, I mean, we talked about it in the car on the way down to the AACC. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you're totally where I knew you would be. I could see it and sense it. But walk us through that process of the growth. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, you know, I think my beloved child was with me in the whole journey. And, and honestly, working together with the Holy Spirit is what gave me the courage to, to actually walk through all of this and 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 make the leap and go for it. Mm. I mean, all along I, my, my beloved self shows up as a pastor, uh, as a coach, um, it, within my own heart. And, mm. um, all along I would have this internal message of Adam, this is the right next step and you can mm. do this. You will figure this out and you will have help to figure this out. And you, you do belong. I mean, my beloved child will sometimes even use reason and carry my wife, use this reason with me too. Here's yeah. my wife's line. Early on, my wife would look at me and say, Adam, Beth and Jeff and Susie are not idiots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she, we tricked her. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she would, she would just, she would just look at me and say like, honey, they see, they see what, what we see, you know, yeah. and, uh, and they're not idiots. So trust it, borrow from their confidence if you need mm. to for a moment. Until and let until your until your heart catches up, you might need to mm -hmm. borrow from their confidence. And I've been borrowing from Carrie's confidence for years because she's always mm -hmm. been such an encouragement and reinforcing that Adam, you can do this. Adam, you're yeah. the right man for this. Uh, and so, but that beloved child, that shepherd voice within my heart was always there. That's why I made the decision. And I, I don't, I don't know um, other than practicing regularly and daily. Um, but with my own, with these parts of myself, practicing uh, check-ins. I, I call, you know, Jeff. I know you call them a team meeting. I do a, I do a parts, a daily parts check-in. I got this from um, Jay Early. He's got a little. Uh, Jay Early has an exercise in his Internal Family Systems book with, of a daily parts check-in. So I, just from practicing, uh, checking in with my parts and leading and guiding my parts, I would say that. Um, obviously I'm, I'm still in recovery and I've not arrived and I still have all these fears and the imposters, they, all that shows up for me, but the beloved child, part of my heart gained more and more confidence and more and more uh, clarity around my, my sense of place on this team, the way my gifts show up to help our organization and help these coaches. Um, and so that part of my heart just began to get more traction and while it's still a daily struggle and 
and sometimes I can be confident and in a moment activated and afraid and anxious. Um, it's a, it's just a daily journey for me. And, um, and this team has been, you guys have been a safe place for me to work all of this out. So, Mm -hmm. well, and I, I think what I would love for people as, as you're listening to this, again, we've given two really big stories, but I think it's so important to use these opportunities, these really big stories that you kind of can't get around. You have to walk through it. Um, but the more you take the time to utilize, again, aware, so awaken, welcome, ask, receive, and engage. And that's all in our book. And we'll, we've done other podcasts around it. But when you take the time to really acknowledge what's going on and tend to your heart in these parts, then when the smaller moments come up on a daily basis, uh, you will feel them a little bit more clearly, but then be able to attune to it even more quickly. And so, you know, sometimes when I feel like the imposter syndrome or, you know, whatever met word that you want to use, like, oh, I'm not a really good mom. Well, what part of my heart is saying that and why? And what does it need? And how can I tend to it and and not shame it, but but give it new direction. And those are little moments that just naturally pop up. I mean, you you won't notice them because they happen so often. That's why we need to see these bigger moments so that the littler moments do actually show up a little bit more clearly. And that's why at Your Enneagram Coach, we're always talking about using the Enneagram like a rumble strip on the highway. When we start to veer off course, we want to actually be alert and awaken to the fact that that's happening. So if I start to feel like my presence doesn't matter, who am I? I want to be awakened to it right then, not when I've fallen off into the ditch and had self-sabotage and created havoc and stuff like that. So use these big moments in your life to become aware and to then navigate your heart in a much healthier way. And that's really what uh, More Than Your Number is all about. Well, Beth and Adam, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing these very personal stories about um, just living out your story by faith uh, with humility and with a heart that's being taught and continues to be taught and applying the truth of the gospel. Uh, We hope this has been an encouragement to all of our listeners and viewers on YouTube. Um, This is what we do. And so if you're interested and want to begin processing some of the questions that you have, about your calling in EIP, be sure to reach out to one of our coaches. You can visit them at myenneagramcoach.com and find a free consultation to find one of our EIP uh, endorsed certified coaches who have actually gone through training. There's uh, over 100 of them now who are ready to help you. We really do believe that this is not only something that has impacted our lives collectively as a team, but we really do believe that it holds genuine value for those who are willing to walk the path. Yep. Now, so you can go and get our book, More Than Your Number. You can find it wherever books are sold. And for those of you who are interested and in overcoming some of these internal messages and shepherding the various parts of you to become an Enneagram coach, uh, be sure to go check us out at www.yourenneagramcoach.com forward slash BEC. Sign up for one of the webinars. We'll be there live answering questions for you, helping you to shepherd your soul in order for you to walk the path that God's called you to. We're so grateful that you joined us. It really is a gift to us and a great reminder uh, whenever we see you all who are listening, when we see you at conferences or see you in other places, we're always so delighted. So thank you so much for your support. Beth, anything else to close us out? Yeah, so just remember that the Enneagram isn't an invitation to work harder. It reveals our need for Jesus because it's the gospel that transforms.